taught us from the word of God concerning being freed by the blood of the cross. We had a two-part message that blessed us. I know it blessed me tremendously. And so this few minutes of review, Holy Spirit let me know is important for where we're going to go today. So trust me, those two, the two-part messages um, entitled Free by the Blood of the Cross is going to help us in our foundation building for our message, our theme for today, the Holy Communion meal. We learned that the blood of the cross at Calvary went to the root of our sin-stained nature and freed us forever. Now, the statement that I made before I began this message is not in conflict with what I said. The legalities of what I just said took place on the cross. But until we receive our brand new immortal bodies, we can still choose to sin in these bodies. But at the same time, sin does not have dominion over us. I saw something out on Facebook by a prophet who was saying, let us not take the grace message the wrong way and think that we can just continue to sin. And I wanted to get into a debate with him, but I wouldn't because that's not what I promised God I would use Facebook for, not debating anybody. And so, but what I would have said to him is you need to sit under a grace, a true grace teacher, and you'll understand that grace doesn't give you a license to sin. It empowers you not to sin. True grace doesn't tell you, teach you, release you to sin. True grace message empowers you not to sin. And until you understand how grace works, because grace is a person, you would think that the grace message is just giving people a license to sin because their sins, past, present, and future, have already been dealt with on the cross. And so what we're doing is giving people the right to sin. Well, we don't, you know, say we, we're giving them a license because people are going to sin until Jesus come back. And we are also capable of sinning, though it's legally no longer a place of dominion over us. What do I mean? We can choose not to. I know a time when I couldn't choose not to. And I would say I wasn't going to do something anymore, and I find myself doing it. But it's different now because I understand he who lives in me is greater. That grace in abundance supersedes over the sin nature that was dealt with on the cross. So I want to repeat that again. The blood of the cross at Calvary went to the root of our sin-stained nature. I have a new nature now, and I can choose not to sin. Hallelujah. And at the same time, I have a new nature, and I can choose not to be sick, not to be poor. They all was covered with the same sacrificial blood. And you can't convince me of anything different. So, if I can choose a sin, I can choose to be sick. I can choose to be poor. <laughs> but none of those things have authority over me anymore. You need to give the Lord some praise right there. The blood of Jesus went to the root. Glory to God. Hallelujah. My new nature doesn't have a sin root. Hello? Our sin nature does not have a sin. Our new nature does not have a sin nature. Glory to God. We've been freed forever from the power of sin. And somebody say the results of our sin nature. Ooh, hallelujah. And the results Sin and the results of sin. We have to teach them both saints. So people can be freed from sin, but they still will fall under the results of sin. What does sin cause when it happened? So many things. So it's not just being delivered from the sin, but it's also being delivered from the results of sin. 
a lot of things resulted because of sin. They were also covered at the cross. I don't have to be an adulterer, a drug addict, a homosexual. I don't have to. Once I get saved, no matter what I was doing, the blood went to the root of that thing. And it no longer has dominion. Now, I might feel the tendencies to still smoke, drink, or have inordinate sexual desires. But I can walk away from it now because I have a new nature. Hello? Thank you, Lord. Come on and give him praise. Come on and give him praise. We've been freed. We've been freed because of the blood of Christ Jesus from the dominion of sin and sickness, poverty and lack, fear and failure. It don't matter what category, the blood of Jesus is enough. Yeah. I give God the glory. That's why we cannot preach bloodless messages and set people free. The Lord's sacrifice purchase a new identity of righteousness for every believer. I don't care what you've been called in the past. I don't care what you even think about your own self. I'm telling you that the Lord's sacrifice purchased a new identity. That takes care of everything. If, I, if I've been confessing I'm a drug addict in Christ Jesus, I'm righteous. Hello? If I think I was born an adulterer because of what my parents did or believe I'm a, I'm a man in a woman's body or whatever it is, I know that the blood of Jesus took care of it. My new identity is righteousness. And the more I declare my righteousness, the less those negative thoughts can rule my life. I can change my thinking my emotions that have been all out of whack by what I believe in my heart. We need to praise the Lord for that. So you don't have to stay stuck, tell your neighbor. You don't have to stay stuck in anything because the blood is all powerful. You need a deliverance today. Deliverance is for you right now in these words that I'm speaking. You can truly be set free. In whom the sun set free is forever free. Give him some praise right there. I just want to praise him. I'm talking about what he's done for us. He freed us by the blood of the cross. Amen. I am too excited. Listen, we are in right standing with our creator. That's what it means to be righteous. We're in right standing with our creator forever and are free to reign in life as the Lord's priests and kings of his kingdom on earth. Yeah. It's important that we no longer have to pray your kingdom come. We can pray your kingdom has come. Amen. Your kingdom has come. Your kingdom moved on the inside of me. Oh, bless his name. The Garden of Eden is back in its place again. I can partake of every blessing of God now. Hallelujah. That's a good word right there. As his royal priests, we handle the all-powerful blood of the Lamb by pleading it and declaring its authority to set every captive free and restoring everything back to Christ because of the success of the cross. And God said that cross, the, the purpose of the cross was to what? Climax and bring everything back to God in Christ. And that's our assignment. Hallelujah. To let everybody know through the precious, all-powerful blood of Jesus that you have a right, hallelujah, to be set free. Oh, bless his name. I don't care what you've done. You have a right. Because when you come into Christ, you get a new nature. All that old stuff has passed away. Your moral and spiritual condition no longer has dominion over you. Now, that's good news right there. So the blood of the lamb has been given to the believer as part of his royal priesthood. So we get to use and handle the blood. We plead the blood of Jesus over people, over things. We rebuke the devil with the blood. There's things that we do with the blood of Jesus. We have the rights 
in Christ Jesus to handle the blood of Jesus. It's all powerful. It's what liberated everything. It's because of the blood. It qualified. Hallelujah. The deliverance from the works of the enemy. As his royal kings, we handle the all-powerful word of God. By declaring and decreeing its power and authority to set every captive free. And again, restoring them back to their creator through the finished works of the cross. What does a king do? A king does not beg. A king legislates and dominates and rules and reigns on earth through Christ Jesus. So, we learned over these last several months that our ministry of reconciliation as ambassadors of Christ is to take our priestly anointing, use the most powerful tool that God has given us, hallelujah, pleading the blood in Jesus' name. And then we, as king, kings in this, in this, uh, on earth, in the world, under the Lord Jesus Christ, he's king of kings, we have the legal right to use his word. That word will drive out anything that doesn't line up with the kingdom. Is that awesome? What more do you need to be successful? <laughs> Hello? We've won. Every fight we fight is fixed. I said every fight we fight is fixed. <laughs> Woo. So on today, we're going to go forward from here and thank God for that review because you're going to see how it's going to tie right into what God is going to show us today. On today, Holy Spirit is here to give us some powerful revelation from the Word of God concerning the truth that the Holy Communion meal was given to the Lord's church. Given to who? The As the proof of the believer's way of escape from every temptation or trial that we will face in this life. Now, I made a long statement, but I need you to get this. I said the Holy Communion meal was given to the Lord's church as the proof of the believer's way of escape from every temptation or trial that we will face in this world. So let's go to scripture to build our foundation because I, I won't say it if I can't prove it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We usually go to 11 and we will. But we're at 10 right now for a reason. Verse 13. God is so good. 1 Corinthians 10, starting with verse 13. Give the Lord some praise right there. Oh, Lord, thank you. Verse 13. Listen, for no temptation, no trial regarding as enticing to sin, no matter how it comes or where it leads, has overtaken you and laid hold on you that is not common to man. That means every test, every temptation that will ever come against us, every single one of us, can face those same trials and temptations. That is, no temptation or trial has come to you that is beyond human resistance and that is not adjusted and adapted and belonging to human experience. I'm pausing so you can reflect on what I'm saying because it's a long verse. And such as man can bear. So there's nothing that will come against you, temptation or trial, that you will experience that you will not be able to bear. But let's see why. But God is faithful to his word and to his compassionate nature. I love it. And he can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried and assayed beyond your ability and strength of resistance 
and power to endure. I don't care what we go through. God said, I am faithful to my word because of my compassionate nature and heart towards you. I will not let you be tempted and tried in a say beyond your ability. Kratos power and strength, dunamis power to resist and power, authority to endure. But with the temptation, he did not tell us we won't have them. Why me, Lord? Why not you? Everybody got to go through stuff. Okay? I'm going to say it again until I get a few more. Amen. Everybody got to go through stuff. Amen. Yeah. So the next time you tempted to say, why me, Lord? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. I mean, 13. And what does it say? He says, but what? But with the temptation, he will always also provide the way out, the means of escape to a landing place. Some translations say a good landing place. That you may be capable and strong and powerful to bear up under it patiently. Now I'm going to deal with that today because some of y'all need a deliverance. But I need to keep reading because God said keep everything in context. Sometimes we take one scripture then we miss the whole meaning or the whole purpose or the whole remedy. God is always sending us remedies. Therefore, my dearly beloved, talking to the church, shun, keep clear away from, avoid to flight if needed. Mean run fast away if needed. Any sort of idolatry of loving or venerating anything more than God. So it can be a number of things that you or I are using as a crutch or idolatry. We can depend more on our spouse, more on our job, more on our physical strength. They all can become idolatry. God says, shun, run from it, keep clear of it. Then he says, I'm speaking as to intelligent, sensible men. He said, I'm expecting you to be intelligent on what I'm about to say. Think over and make up your minds for yourselves about what I say. I appeal to your reason and your discernment in these matters. Now, the next verse is in context. Most of us would never keep reading there. We think we have a thorough thought. He says, now he talks about the cup of blessing of wine at the Lord's Supper upon which we ask God's blessing, does it not mean that in drinking it, in drinking the cup, what does the cup represent? The blood. The blood. The cup represents the blood. Yeah. We participate in and share a fellowship, a communion. We call it the Holy Communion meal. In the blood of Christ, when we drink the cup, we're participating in and sharing. Are you with me? A communion in the blood of Christ, the Messiah. The bread which we break, does it not mean, what's the bread represent? The body. Does it not mean that in eating it, we participate in and share a fellowship, a communion in the body of Christ. So now we see both parts of the Holy Communion meal, both elements. And I'm here to say to you today, and I won't get ahead of myself, but I want to say it more than one time. There's two parts to the Holy Communion meal that's important. They each have their own importance. 
So the Bible is saying here in the 16th verse, we're fellowshipping with the Lord's blood for forgiveness. It has given us forgiveness and makes us eternally righteous. When you're forgiven, you got to become something else. Your identity is righteousness. So you don't just get forgiven and that's it. You get forgiven and you are eternally righteous. Okay, that's the gift that comes with being forgiven. What forgives us? What forgives us? The blood. Hallelujah. But when we eat the bread, which represents the body, the other part of that Holy Communion meal that's vitally important is we get healed. You can't just get forgiven, and that's all. The Holy Communion table has two parts, and we must understand it if it's going to work for us. Because if you want the truth, it's all we got. You can try other things, and they might work sometime. I'm telling you, the Holy Communion meal is all the church has to be forgiven and to be healed. And I'm just so sad that everybody in our church ain't in here because I'm telling you this word is vital today. And I'm preaching it with authority because I believe it. So I'm going to focus on y'all that's here. So we're fellowshipping with his stripes that have healed us when we eat the bread. We're fellowshipping with his blood that gives us forgiveness when we drink the cup. If you and I don't understand that, we will never ever walk in our full and divine health. We'll be playing with sickness for the rest of our life. Some of y'all done had too many repeated things that have come back. They have no right. And I'm speaking to myself. I, that's enough. We need to put a stake in the ground. Either the Holy Communion is the proof of it, that the cross did happen, or it's just a waste of time. I'm not doing anything that's a waste of time. And I do it every single day, so I know it's vitally important. That's why I can stand here today. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And somebody got to qualify. What do I mean by that? Every believer qualifies, but you, you got to qualify to the fact that you are representative of what this, hallelujah, this holy communion meal represents. Otherwise, you just eating a cracker and you just drinking some juice. That's not why he gave it to us. Y'all get in here. Thank you, God. Y'all be the first one saying I need prayer. So he says in the next verse, for we no longer, no matter how numerous we are, are one body because we all partake of the one bread. The bread is Christ, the living bread. The one whom the communion bread represents. We are one body. We are his body. As he is in his body, so are we. And it's time for our minds to be renewed so that we can represent him on earth. Glory to God. He said, pray every day that it be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are you with me so far? So let's break this down. We know that in this world, we are going to have temptations and trials. Our body going to be tempted. Our finances are going to be tempted. Our marriage is going to be tempted. Our singleness is going to be tempted. We're going to be tempted where our children are concerned. We are going to have temptations and trials, and God never lied to us. Amen. 
Why? Because Satan, the prince of the power of the air and his demonic influences are on the earth trying to stop our victory in the finished works of the cross. He is not coming against us for no other reason than to stop what the finished works have done. Because when something is finished, it's finished. You don't have to do nothing else to it but receive it. The devil don't want us to know it's finished. And how do I know we don't know? Because too many believers is trying to get something that's already done. Just listen to the way they talk and the way they pray. Not mad with nobody but the devil. 2 Corinthians. We're going to come back there, so mark that. That's uh, 1 Corinthians. We're going to come back. But I want us to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Let's start with three. I hear you, Holy Ghost. I didn't have three written, but he said you start with three. But even if our gospel, the glad tidings, also be hidden, obscured, and covered up with a veil that hinders the knowledge of God. When you block the true gospel, you block the knowledge of God, the true knowledge of God. Blocking the gospel comes to hinder the knowledge of God. It is hidden only to those who are perishing and obscured, only to those who are spiritually dying. You can sit in a church and be spiritually dying and veiled. You could be sitting in a church and veiled. Only to those who are lost. For the God, small g, Satan, the God of this world, He's the God of this world system. All the systems are under Satan. The earth belongs to God, so don't get that confused. The world system is under Satan. The earth, we, the believer, still has authority. Jesus gave it back to us. But the world systems, the governments and all those things are under the prince of the power of the air. That's why stuff is going on the way it is because Satan woke up one day and recognized, you know I'm just paraphrasing because he don't go to sleep, he's a spirit. He woke up one day and said, my time is just about up. I got to go crazy in this world. So I'm going to make everything crazy. You don't believe yes is no and no is yes. He just, he want the world so confused they don't even know if up is down and down is up. And if you're not careful, you'll be swept up into that foolishness. You won't even talk spiritual. You just talk what you see on TV. You'll just talk negative all the time. The devil is a liar. I talk to the TV on purpose. I put my words of God in the atmosphere. I combat the words of the devil. I don't get an agreement that Satan's going to win or no human person being used by him is going to win. God has already won. He can't have the earth. And his time over this world system is just about up. But until then, we have a work to do. Glory to God. And God is trying to tell us how to escape every single temptation and trial that comes against us because we are going to go through them. Are you with me today? So the God of this world blinded the unbeliever's mind. You can sit in church and be an unbeliever. There's some of you sitting here right now toiling with whether you believe your body can be healed and set free from anything that you don't have to sin anymore. You're toiling with that thing. You're fighting with that thing every time you get a symptom. You let fear take over and you run away from God rather than to God. Hello? Why is he blinding the unbelievers' minds that they should not discern the truth? What is the truth? His body healed us. His blood forgave us and declared us, don't leave it out, righteous eternally. 
I'm right with God. It's nothing I can do to change that ever again. I'm right with God. Hallelujah. He put his stamp of approval when he gave me a brand new nature. Oh, bless his holy name. Preventing them from seeing. That's what his blindness comes. Preventing them from seeing what? The illuminating light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, the Messiah. Oh, God, I love you. What's his assignment? To stop you from seeing what belongs to you, your inheritance. Now, I'm preaching harder than you saying amen, but I'm going to keep going because I'm telling you I feel this thing. I feel deliverance in this house. To keep you from receiving the revelation, the knowledge, the illuminating light. Because when the gospel is preached, the glory of Christ is released and light goes on where there's darkness. You can't hear the true gospel and stay in darkness unless you choose not to. Christ the Messiah, who is the image and likeness of God. Listen, the word of God reveals in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that the spirit of God will always provide the way, the means of an escape to a good landing place. Come on, let's go back there because I want you to see words. You can't say, Apostle, just, you know, she said that. No, I want the scripture to say that. What does it say in verse 16? We're back in 1 Corinthians 10. I told you we would be going back and forth there. In verse 16. I'm sorry, verse 13. The lower part of verse 13 says, where it starts with but, but with the temptation, he will what? Come on, talk to me. Always also provide what? Does it say a way? What's the difference between a way and the way? A way means it could be a whole bunch of different ways. The way means there ain't but one. I'm about to shout all by myself. So if you think he don't have your way, you don't listen to the devil's lies. I will not say God is a healer. He is the healer. And when something is the with me, that's the source. I don't need to consult nobody else. You can't talk to me about something God told me. That he is the way. Why the devil hates us? He don't like this. He don't like this. He wanted me not to be standing up here today. <laughs> Let me get on back over here. Not a way, but the way. I want you to know that. So the next time the devil comes up in your face when you're going through a temptation, a trial, a test, you say, the way has already been made for me. Yes. Woo! Glory to God. He is the way. Let's go to John 14. Put your finger there and let's go to John 14. We're coming back now, 1 Corinthians 10, but I want us to do these little rabbit trails because I like to build. I'm building you for an explosion going on up in here. Let's go to John chapter 14. What a good word. The Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, verse 6. Let's read it together in the Amplified. We said he is the way. Let's prove it. Jesus said to him, are you there? I am the way. It ain't no a way. Jesus is the way. He the only way you need. He is the source. When you hear me say that we don't need a plan B, I'm telling you because I believe he is the way. 
I don't need to seek nobody else's whatever. They might be right sometime, but there's a great possibility they're wrong a lot. But God is never wrong. Jesus said to them, to him, I am the way and I am the truth. I don't need to seek, seek truth from nobody else. And I am, I don't need life from nothing else. He is the life. No one comes to the Father except by and through me. Let's go back over. Ooh, glory to 1 Corinthians 10. Is, is, is that good? Is that a confirming word? I just want stuff to be confirmed now because we're building foundation. Amen. That we will not be moved from. So, hallelujah. You hear me say when I serve the Holy Communion table, God taught me this. Because I used to, and I'm not saying you did. I'm saying me because I always use me as an example. Then I can't get mad at me. Because if I use you, you might get mad. You always hear me say when I serve Holy Communion now that these elements are the proof. You hear me say that? They're the proof of our complete redemption. They're the proof that I'm already healed. They're the proof that I'm already forgiven. Now, I used to receive Holy Communion. First of all, we had this big charade that we walked through the church and went to anybody we thought we had offended and we couldn't use it, take the communion until we repented to somebody. If we was mad with them, they hurt us or we was holding something. Y'all remember that? Most of y'all, if you've been church, you've been there. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were taught. Well, first of all, we had our focus on sin. Who, you know, and if you was anything like me, I had a line that was out the door. Everybody was mad with me about something. I know you didn't. You'd have nobody in your line. Because you just pleased everybody. <laughs> I didn't compromise, so folk was really mad with me a lot. Hello? But the point of it is, we spent our 90% of our time focusing on sin. When what does sin have to do with it if the blood forgave every sin? So that should never have been our focus. Then, secondly, we were focusing on what? Trying to get healed. If I'm already here, why should my focus be on trying to get healed? Y'all ain't saying nothing. Y'all shutting down. We spent our time. That wonderful, holy, all-powerful meal was spent on sin and sickness. Because <laughs> we didn't have a clue about past tense anything. We was always in the future. And I look much better than I look right now. The devil a liar. I look real good right now. <laughs> and I'm going to continue this process. I ain't got to wait to the future. We were always looking to the future to be forgiven, the future to be healed. And it never was because we weren't taught that. So the Holy Communion could not do what God intended for it to do. Because God is a God of governmental order. He's not going to accept our traditions of men that make the word of God of none effect. And I pray somebody in television land will get this today as well. But we got to get it, saints. And I'm here to preach it. And I'm going to say amen to my own self. I'm going to do like Mother Sherman. I'm going to pat myself on the back. Go, girl, preach it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. All right. <laughs> they're the proof and I want to deal with that the proof is in our daily holy communion meal it is the tree of life remember God told them they could eat from any tree in the garden but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil but of the tree of life they could eat it but once they ate from the tree of knowledge he had to take them out of the garden because he couldn't have them touching that tree anymore why because that tree would have kept them alive in sin forever so he had to let them die down down the portals of time so that jesus could come and resurrect us amen so but the tree of life holy communion table is the tree of life <laughs> It's the tree of life. Every time I partake of that table, 
I'm reminded, body, you're already healed. Straighten up. Every time I partake of, of, the, of the blood of the table, I say, body, you're already forgiven. Straighten up. You don't have to practice that no more. You have to stay mad. You don't have to retaliate. You don't have to feel sad. You don't have to be rejected. You don't have to let nobody do anything to you because you can choose how you feel about everything and anything because God has given you the liberty. Just tell yourself who you are. Who am I? The righteousness of God. What am I? Anything that God say I am. And what you say, do not measure up to what God has said. So whose report? Talk about me all you want to. I don't care. And I used to care. And some people say they don't care. They're lying. But I don't care. Because I'm too reprogrammed. I'm too reprogrammed. I took time to work on me. And if you still believe in the opinions of people, it's because you didn't take time to work on you, so don't get mad with me. Because I'm not cocky or prideful. I'm just knowledgeable of what God has said. And whose report do I believe? I believe God's report. I won't tell you the conversation, but I had a conversation with my husband one day, and he said to me, well, what has changed on the way you feel now? I said, I'm not afraid anymore. I am so secure in God. I'm good. I, I'm straight. <laughs> I'm straight. I am. I woke up one day and said, this is who God says I am, and I'm going to believe him. And I don't have to put up with no foolishness anymore. I can make that decision to be crazy or not, mad or not, glad or not, sick or not. Y'all ain't saying nothing, poor or not. I'll make a decision now based on not me, what God said. It's written. <laughs> it is written. And his blood finished it. And that's why I made a decision never to let a day go by that I do not receive the proof that I'm finished. And every time I partake of his body and I partake of his blood, I'm constantly reminded. See, I'm reprogramming my mind through an element that's powerful enough to do what it says. I'm reminded the proof that is past tense. So I don't slip up anymore and say, God, will you heal me? God, will you deliver me? Why, God? I don't talk like that anymore. Why? Because I've spent enough time in the proof that it's a done deal. So don't get mad with me because I ain't whimpering and whining. I told my administrative staff that Cheryl that came and started this church several years ago, she don't exist no more. That person nearly killed me. <laughs> I said, that person nearly killed me. That flesh person nearly killed me. I thought I, was, I thought I was trapped in a body that I couldn't do nothing about. And I found out the lowest part of me is this flesh, and it does what I tell it. And if it don't hear me the first time, I keep talking. <laughs> Why? Because I'm talking spirit and life. I'm talking truth. I know that the word is the highest vibrations of power. It's creative. It's all powerful. And if I want to reprogram my world, I got to say it enough. So the Holy Communion table is the proof, past tense, because he's not going to the cross for me again. I study Hebrew 9 and 12 so much until it's a part of my, it has become flesh with me. It's engrafted in me. I know that it was his blood that redeemed me. I have a complete redemption. That was the first scripture that came up out of my mouth when I made a decision I would not sit here and die. That was the first scripture that rose up in me. I said, I have a complete redemption. Devil, you are lying. And I started getting better from that moment. Why? Because I had put in the time to get that word to be one with me. He said, if you would abide in my word, if you would meditate in my word day and night, if you would use it as medicine, it will supernaturally 
heal your mind. The first thing you need to be healed is your mind because that's the target of Satan. He cannot target your spirit if it's born again, but he can show enough target your mind. And when he targets your mind, there goes your body. Because your body will go with whatever. Oh, it'll go with whatever. And one minute I can say we ain't eat no more and we don't eat no more. And the next minute I say we're going to eat some more and the body say, yeah, let's eat. And I say, are we hungry? No, let's just eat. It'll go with whatever. And I'm serious. It ne and it never is satisfied because it's lustful. Somebody say proof. I want you to write down these definitions of the word proof. That which confirms. Proof is that which confirms. The authentication, authentication, I'm not pronouncing it right, but you can help me, authentic, authentication, thank you. The confirmation, the demonstration, talking about proof, the evidence. The testimony, the validation, the verification, the warranty deed. If you didn't get it, get it from somebody else. Let's move on. Listen, the proof. The proof in our daily Holy Communion meal that it is the tree of life. The Apostle Paul declares a phenomenal revelation in the very next chapter to confirm that the Holy Communion table is the way of escape from every temptation and every trial that you and I would face. The proof is the Holy communion table you see the context in 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 first Corinthians 10 and verse 13 through verse 17 it's context he talks about the temptation and he says the way of escape is the holy communion table we never I'm telling you God opened that thing because why because we always go to first Corinthians 11 Absolutely, just going with the 13th 13th verse, 13th verse, but it connects with verse the other verses. But that's the that's the proof of our way of escape is the Holy Communion table. So let's. I want to lift up verse 29 and 30. I'm going there on purpose for a reason to connect with what we just read. Over, we're in we're in First Corinthians 11, and this is the revelation that most of us have concerning. The Holy Communion table, which a lot of us did not rightly divide this for years. But look at some new things the Holy Spirit has given me for us for today. So I said, you might think you've heard it before, but you didn't hear it like this before. Amen. Verse 29 and 30. Let's read it. Amplified Bible says, for anyone who eats, what are we eating? Yeah, what part are we eating of the Holy Communion? We're eating the body. For anyone who eats the body and drinks, what are we drinking? The blood and drinks the blood without discriminating and recognizing with due appreciation that it is Christ's body. I want to stop right there for a minute. When we eat the body and drink the blood without discriminating or another word is discerning or to discern that word means to perceive when we eat the body and drink the blood without discerning without perceiving or recognizing without clear understanding that's what it's talking about he's not talking about we can just eat it wrong because we're wrong he's saying we don't understand the difference between these two elements is the way of escape for every temptation. Hallelujah. Because this 
uh, 1 Corinthians 11 is written in chapters, but it was a letter. It goes together. So 10 and 11 flows together. So it's saying to us, discern means to distinguish that the bread is the Lord's body and the cup is the Lord's blood. You and I got to settle that. When I hold those elements in my hand, I got to know that the bread is for something and the blood is for something. And if I want a way of escape from every temptation and trial, I need to understand the power in both of them because they both were done for me for, for a reason, to escape. Then it says, we have to discern and recognize and appreciate and discriminate that it is Christ's body. So we got to settle it. We have to take our mind away from that. It's, it's the cracker or the bread or whatever natural element you're using, or the cup, the juice, the wine, or whatever water. You can use, even use water because it's not, that's not the important part. We get technical. The technical technology or, or what, sh what, we should be, what sh we should be focusing on is that it's his body and focusing on that it's his blood, not what the natural element is. Once we hold it and put it in its place of our way of escape from every temptation and trial, I have to look at those elements the way God told me to look at them. He said, Anyone who eats and drinks without discriminating, without discerning, without understanding, without recogni uh, recognizing, with due appreciation. What am I appreciating? That this is the Christ's body. He then tells me what happens when I don't. Eats and drinks a sentence. A verdict of judgment upon himself. Because I said it before and I'm going to say it again. It's the believer's only way. To escape. The world don't have the answers. They're trying to discover stuff all the time. And it doesn't always work. Well, you have to cut it off or cut it out or drug it up or whatever when you don't know what to do with it. And that's not, I'm not saying anything negative against them. That's their assignment. They practice. That's what it's called. God don't practice. God gave us a perfect remedy to escape every temptation and every trial. The cup of blessing and the bread. And this is the proof. That, verse 30, that careless and unworthy participation. What is it talking about? We can't take this scripture and stand alone. We got to connect it with verse 29. It told us, if we eat and drink without discerning that this is Christ's body, that careless and unworthy participation, you're participating, looking at it as a natural element when it's not anymore for us. We're looking at it as the body and the blood of our Savior. Well, what did they do for us? And if we don't understand it's the proof, then we're going to be saying, what can it do for us? We can't say anymore, what can it do for us? We have to say, what is already done for us? It's proof because it's already done it. And I got to say that to myself enough until I believe it, till it becomes flesh, till my body starts reflecting that engrafted word that I talked about at the altar. And I can't be lazy. Because if a physical doctor told me to take my pills three times a day, I'm a fool if I don't, if that's the, uh, the remedy that I want to use to get my body healed. So why would I do God's word once in a while or once a week when I'm working on something that's trying to take me out of here? Faith cometh by hearing. My faith has ears. It's got to hear the word. It can't hear TV. It can't hear somebody's opinion. It can't hear somebody's diagnosis. It's got to hear what God says. My faith cannot come until I hear God's word. It won't come up out of me, full of the Holy Ghost, if I don't hear God's word. How can they hear when I take my preacher's ministry and message as just something whatever, flip it? 
I'll hear it. I won't hear it. I'll miss it. She teaches in series, so I don't have to get the tapes. I don't need to catch up. Well, I can catch up when I get back. Are you kidding me? You miss sentences. You miss statements. You miss revelations. You can't catch up like that. You can't come in a, on half of a message and think you can go back to what I started with. Are you kidding me? Who are you fooling? The devil's using you. And he want to kill you. And you helping him. Because who said faith cometh by hearing the word? Who said they can't hear without a preacher? Who are you to say something different? So that careless and unworthy participation is the reason many of you, who is this letter written to? It ain't talking to the world. Many of you in the church, many of you in the church, this is the reason many of you are weak and sickly and quite enough of you have fallen asleep in the sleep of death. Die prematurely. You didn't finish your purpose. Now you mad with God. Now you mad with the church. Now you mad with you. When God told us, this is the way of escape. Escape from what? Being weak, sick, and dying prematurely. Can you take this out of context and try to make it say something else? He said, we must discern that the body of Christ healed us already, causing us to be strong and healthy and living a long, prosperous life. So when I eat his body, I expect to be strong. When I fell Friday night, I was strong enough to keep my face from hitting that pavement. There was something living inside of me called the Holy Ghost. He didn't say we wouldn't go through stuff. Everybody in here could trip and fall. Everybody could eat something from a restaurant that's contaminated. You don't know it before you eat it. Are you kidding me? Everybody can cross the street and some crazy person come out of nowhere and hit you and kill you. That have nothing to do with, with anything. Every temptation that comes is common to humanity. So that means while we in this world, we could face anything. But how we go through it makes the difference. My way of escape is because I spend time in that Holy Communion meal, and I already know that when that situation comes, I need to be able to say, his body has already healed me. His blood has already forgiven me. I am eternally righteous forever. I have rights and privileges in the kingdom of God. I have a right to put a demand. I have a right to rebuke the devil. I have a right to use the name of Jesus. I have a right to declare the word of God. I have a right to walk in total wholeness. I have a right to be prosperous and wealthy. I have a right to be successful and victorious. That is my way of escape. He did it for me. He said, until I come back, continuously bring me into remembrance of what I've already done for you. He didn't say remind me of what I have to do for you. He said, I went to that cross one time. And until you take those elements and understand the power that you hold in your hand, you're just eating a cracker and drinking some juice. And I told you you wouldn't because God is building our revelation in this house. And it's not just for me. It's for whosoever will. I can't make you receive it, but I'm going to stand here and put it out. And whoever will, I'm for you. Every believer must. It is critical that we discern, that we understand, that we discriminate, that we recognize that there is two parts of the Holy Communion meal that does two different things for our escape from every temptation or trial. All weaknesses, all sicknesses, all death. Let's go up to verse 26 and 27 of this same chapter. Shout out both sides. For every time 
How many times? Every time you eat this bread. That's his body. And drink this cup. That's his blood. You are representing and signifying and proclaiming. You're declaring something. The fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. Now what's his death finished on the cross? You and I are proclaiming the finished works of the cross. Not what he's going to do, but what he has done. He finished everything on the cross. There's nothing left for him to do concerning my life. Every day of my life is written down in a book. Success is over my name in every area. He did not recreate me to fail. I can only fail when I get off the good and narrow path. Let's go there. Turn, to, to, uh, put it up on the screen. Uh, Ephesians. I'm going faster than my brain. Ephesians 2 and 10. I'm flowing, y'all. Whosoever will, get it. For we are, come on, read it with me. We are God's own handiwork, his workmanship. That means we are his masterpiece. He gave me that word the other day for my book. Recreated in Christ Jesus. He didn't recreate us for nothing, for us to continue to live under the curse. DNA, stuff that we inherited from our fathers and mothers because it's in our blood. He said, we've been born anew. You know I got I to gotta meditate on that till it becomes flesh. Until my body starts what? Reflecting the truth of that word. If it ain't lined up with me, stop lying about how much time you're spending in the word. With the Holy Ghost. I'm not talking about your professional mind. Your intellect. You can't bring revelation. I don't care how smart you are. A dumb person. When I say dumb, I'm talking about somebody who we would consider dumb in the natural. Can be smarter than us. If they get with the Holy Ghost. We're born anew. That we may what? Do those good works. God did not recreate me to do bad works. Which God predestined. He what? He planned beforehand. His plan is in place for us. I don't care what off road we've been on. We can get on the right road when we discover that he pre-planned the right life for me to live. He said, for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time. All I got to do is get up every single new day, declare I'm the righteousness of God. Where you taking me today? What you want me to do, Lord? I want your heart. I want your mind on this situation. I want to be in the right place at the right time. I want to think the right things. I want to do the right things. I want what you prepared ahead of time for me. That means every day of my life there's a plan prepared ahead of time for me. Amen. He already know that I'm going to XYZ job or I'm going to XYZ grocery store today. He planned for me to be successful where I go. So I say, Lord, whoever you want me to meet when I get there, whatever you want me to say, however you want me to smile, whatever you want me to do, I'm yours. You already knew what my day would be like and you planned in that day. For us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them living. You better help me. The good life. Ain't no sickness good. I can't minister to you all broke up and hurting and in pain. I can't focus straight. Living the good life which he prearranged. And therefore, I don't have no business quoting the scripture in, in 1 John that says, as he is, so am I. I don't need to say it if I accept being all broke up and sick and afflicted and poor and crazy and, 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 and losing and y'all ain't saying nothing. I don't have no business making that confession if I don't believe that, I, that as he is, so am I. I need to shut up. 
till I've settled that. Shout out both sides. We don't have nothing else, and it works because it's spirit and life. It's got, it's got to become flesh with you, though, that we shall walk in them, living the good life, which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. That settles it. So, so every time, I'm in verse 26 again, every time, every time, every time, and if I'm working on something, I need to do it every day. And if need be, three times a day. Because if a natural doctor can get me to take pills that's affecting some of my other organs, that I need some more pills, I need to take the pills that have no side effects. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are representing and signifying and proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. Well, what do I think about his death? His death was substitutionary. His death finished everything. His death paid the price. His death purchased me. It was his body and his blood included in his flesh, in his, in his, his uh, sacrifice. His sacrifice was not without his body and his blood. So when I partake of his body and his blood, I'm saying, what you did on the cross is mine. Now I got to settle what he did on the cross. And if I say, anybody is sick, anybody is, is, it has a right to die prematurely, anybody has a, a, a right to be kept in bondage, I am refuting the finished work of the cross. And the devil, I told him, you can't get me to say that again. I don't care if my finger falling off. I will not say it. He planned for me today to have all my fingers in place. The good life. Ain't nothing good about my finger hanging off. Or my toe wrote rotten off. Come on, saints. My body parts attacked by the devil. God is not in cahoots with the devil. God don't use the devil's stuff. He took care of the devil's stuff on the cross. Why would he go back? Once and for all, the Bible says. Verse 27. So then whoever eats the bread, whoever, and drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that is unworthy of, tell me what the next word is. You know how long we had thought we were unworthy? So we couldn't tell. Oh, I can't take this because I ain't worthy. I'm unworthy today. I did something today. Honey, you need it today and every day. And keep taking it until you stop doing that. But it's talking about him, unworthy of him. What are you unworthy of? Not accepting what his body did and what his blood did. It's simple. How can we mix that up? That I got to get right before I can take the Holy Communion? I'm right because I'm born again. I need the Holy Communion because it's my way of escape. Shut up, both sides. So the word is saying the unworthiness is the fact that I am not proclaiming the Lord's death, what he did, his finished works on the cross. That's the problem. But the, I, am, I am declaring what he did is unworthy. Because it's of him, not of me. I'm not unworthy. I'm declaring what he did is unworthy. Of being my source. Then he says, what will happen? You will be guilty of profaning and sinning against what? It says it right here. The body and blood of the Lord. Of the Lord. What did his body do? What did his blood do? If I don't accept it, I'm saying what he did is unworthy. It makes my heart hurt to see people in the body of Christ dying prematurely because they don't have revelation what he did. Do you understand what he had to go through 
on that cross for us. He had human feelings. He put down his deity. So he bled and he felt and he had feelings in his muscles and his nerve endings and all of that stuff. The Bible said he agonized so bad in that garden until his sweat had blood in it. Not because he didn't want to do it, but because he knew his human body had to go through it. Can you go through all of those things at one time? We can't hardly go through one thing at a time without complaining. We have a great temptation to have pity put on us, and we love to tell people how bad we feel. So somebody will pay us attention, negative attention. And he says, let a man thoroughly examine himself. What are you examining yourself for? Showing for sin. He took care of that with the blood. Or are you saying he didn't? Examine yourself to make sure that you stay in line with what you, we just got through reading in those prior scriptures. Don't take stuff out of context and make a denominational crap. Because that's all it is. Let a man thoroughly examine himself. And only when he has done so should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup because if you don't do it properly, you're going to be down here in verse 30. Your careless and unworthy participation is the reason many of you are weak and sick and quite enough of you have fallen into the sleep of death. He don't want us to die prematurely. He wants us to live and be healthy and strong. So we can declare as Jesus is right now, that's why he took it so we don't have to. He was punished so we don't have to be punished. In the courts of heaven, it's illegal for the devil to charge us with a, with a sin, with a sickness, with something our family members did, what, whatever generational stuff. It's a, it is absolutely illegal for the devil to accuse us because Jesus is standing right there with the, his palms up. He said, look at my feet and my hands. How dare you? Look at my side. The church was birthed out of the blood and water of my side. I did it for them. I didn't do it for me. He didn't just die for us. He died as us. If he died as us and he took every sickness, every weakness, every distress, every premature death, if he took every sin, every single thing that we would ever do in this life and he bore it on the cross for us, it's illegal in the courts of heaven for the devil to accuse us ever again. That's why you got to settle my sins are forgiven past, present, and future. And when I mess up, I'm running to God because I'm already, come on, that blood is here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for a blood bath right now. Wash me in the blood. I don't want to ever do this again. Grace don't teach you to sin. Grace, if you're taught right, it says I don't have to. The law said if you commit adultery, you are what? Condemned of God. The law can't stop you from committing adultery. Grace said if you commit adultery, the blood of Jesus has forgiven you. The, the, uh, grace is the only thing that can, can strengthen you not to. Grace can, can empower you not to commit adultery. The law can empower you not to sin. Grace empowers you. The Bible said it super imposes over the law. Is that not right? We got a power source living inside of us. We got to know we have already overcome. We got to know this fight is fixed. We got to know we've already won. We got to walk in our inheritance and stop letting a lying devil who's been sentenced have his way. Every other week you sick and afflicted. Every other week you don't have no money for something. Every other week you confused. Come on, saint, you're mad, you're up, you're down. We're living the life of carnality when we do that. Because we won't eat strong meat. We just want to keep on sucking on a bottle. Pampering our flesh. Getting mad when we hear the truth because we don't want to change. I can't preach this to you and I'm still living foolishly. Because there will be no anointing on my life. I can't gather the glory to my life if I'm living any kind of way, doing anything. That's one place you can't play is with God. 
You might can play in the natural realm and pretend for a while, but let me tell you, everything come up, will come uncovered anyway, but it take longer. But in God, oh no. Oh, uh-uh. It won't work, y'all. I said it won't work. So what is the Lord saying to us? He says in verse 29 and 30, we must discern that the body of Christ healed us, past tense, causing us to be strong, healthy, and to live a long, prosperous life in Christ. And then it says, we must also discern that the blood of Jesus forgave us of all of our sins, past, present, and future, and has finished, hallelujah, hallelujah, and purchased our gift of eternal righteousness. We're right with Oh, Lord, I'm trying to finish. I'm trying to finish. I don't know. I don't think I can. Let me see what time it is. Okay. All right, I'm going to go a little further. So, so what do we see here? I want, I want you to really put this in to, to memory so that you can build your faith on this. Because we have got to start escaping from the temptations and trials. He said, they're going to be in this world. We got to learn how. The Holy Communion table is our way of escape. It's the proof in our daily lives that Jesus already provided for us in that meal the tree of life every time you get in agreement with God your body lines up come on saints every time you get in agreement with God concerning his body your body lines up every time you get in agreement with God concerning your forgiveness and your righteousness your body lines up a person who believes they're righteous is not going to return back like a pig to the mud or dog to his vomit. You will not. You refuse. You'll fight for your life to walk in what's yours. Hallelujah. So listen. So, the Lord's body represents the bread from heaven. His body was broken and striped for our healing. Finished. The Lord's cup represents the blood from heaven. His blood, the cup of blessing, was poured out for our forgiveness. And on Calvary's cross, he now declares us righteous. This righteousness is our new identity. Glory to God. The scripture reveals to us that when we drink the cup of blessing, that we read in John, I mean in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, when we drink the cup of blessing, that's the Lord's blood, scripture declares we are what? Participating. Let's go back there and look at that real quick. Chapter 10. Because I, want, I want you to leave here with such a, a foundation in you that you will never be the same again. Never be the same again. And if this tape don't sell out, media, then I missed it. Okay. Chapter 10 and 16. Because nobody can mem remember all of this. Because I can't. Because some of it ain't on my paper. He took me to some other scriptures while I was standing here. All right. Um, what did I say? Right. Okay. So when we drink the cup of blessing, the Lord's blood, it, dis it declares right here that we participate in and share a fellowship. A communion in the blood of Christ. So, so we're, we're agreeing that the blood did all of this. So every time we receive that Holy Communion cup, we need to be saying, I am participating. I'm sharing a fellowship in the blood. Good God Almighty. In the blood of Christ the Messiah. So what did he say to me? He said, tell my people, ask my people, what did the blood of Jesus do for us? Hebrews 9 and 12 says that once and for all, is that right? He went into the holies of holies of heaven, not by the blood of goats and calves in order to reconcile us, but it was his own blood Every time I receive that cup of blessing, I'm actually saying that his blood purchased my complete redemption. Now, you can put that on the board. Do you have it on the board? Good. 
Okay, because I'm trying to move quickly, so I'm, I'm not trying to. Okay, he went once and for all. Cause that that's flesh with me. I I that's that's mem I have memorized that scripture. It's one of my favorite scriptures. It really helped me to walk in my healing. He went once and for all into the holies of holies of heaven, not by virtue of the blood of goats and calves, by which to make reconciliation between God and man. So what did he do that made reconciliation between God and man? It says it right there. His own blood. So it wasn't the blood of goats and calves that was a temporary sacrifice. It was his own blood. Now, we already know from studying today what did, what, what did his blood do for us? Forgave us of. That's why you got to know the two elements of what they each did in order to escape every temptation. So you don't want to just escape uh, uh, sickness and disease. You want to escape any kind of other sinful thing. You want to be able to escape anything that comes after you, all right? So you got to understand that this part is for this and this part is for that, but together, for, that's it. Eternally righteous forever. We're righteous forever. That's it. Yeah, so I need to be thinking, what did his own blood do for me? Having found, this is what it did. Look, it says it. Found and what? When something has secured, it's, it's locked up. And what? That, I love that word complete because devil can't put anything in front of me and make me receive it. It's complete, complete redemption. You need to study the word redemption. We've been redeemed back to him. We've been bought back. Jesus said the devil can't take not one out of my hands. That's what... Jesus said. So I don't care what I do. The devil can't take me out of God's hands. Now God can chastise me when I do stuff that's not right. He the only one have a right to. I belong to him. And God said, if I don't chastise you when you do stuff wrong, you're a bastard. I love everyone that's mine. And so when I see you out of order, he ain't going to chastise me with something he put on the cross of Jesus. So I ain't got to worry about him chastising me with no cancel. That comes only from the devil. Oh, God took him. The devil is a liar. We blame everything on God. He's not going to, God is not going to chastise me. God chastises me with his word. He'll say to me, Cheryl, you're not walking in love. Cheryl, you're not walking in love. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to back up a little bit here, and I'm going to let you see how it feels not to be loved. For a season, you ain't going to feel no love. When you come back up to me, you're going to love everybody. Because you don't like how that feels. Uh-huh. Yeah. You want to play with me? I'll show you. But if I don't chastise you when I keep telling you to stop and you won't, See, because God don't chastise us right away. God is long-suffering, but he's not forever suffering. And some of us don't know we right at the brink. There's some consequences, and we don't like it. But he ain't going to let no devil kill us now. That's over. That's under the blood. Let me get that clear. Put that scripture back up so we can just finish it. It says, having found and secured a complete redemption, what? And What? What? What do everlasting mean? What his body did is eternal. What his blood did is eternal. And it's time for the church to walk in it. And the holy communion table is our way of escape from every temptation of the devil. Satan can't touch his body and Satan can't touch his blood. When it came time for Jesus to die, he said, can't nobody kill me. He said, I give up my spirit. Nobody can kill me. Can no devil touch the blood. That's why when you say the blood of Jesus covers my car, the blood of Jesus, you stay in communion with him. Don't you be off sinning and carrying on. You driving 100 miles an hour, you got your finger up at people. Stop it. <laughs> God ain't giving us no license just to act like crazy people.
come on. When I'm tempted to tell you off and cuss you out, the Holy Spirit is in there saying, don't do that, Cheryl. I'm going to judge them, and I'll deal with them. You just stop it. You stop it, Cheryl. Bring your voice down. God had to teach me how to talk down, because if I talk up, I ain't talking about preaching, but if I talk up, I'm getting ready to fight you. So I talk down. I talk soft. Because I'm feeling something starting to rise up in me. See, we need to know ourselves. I know me. I can't get loud with you because I'm going beyond that. Tempt yourself if you want to. That old flesh will resurrect its crazy self. I started to say black self, but everybody might not be black in here. But anyway, it'll resurrect itself. Here you just went from this wonderful Holy Ghost filled preacher to some crazy lady chasing around somebody with a knife telling I'm going to kill you. It does happen. That's why people in prison and they speaking in tongues in prison right now. They got a prison ministry. We cannot trust our flesh. I don't know how I got off on that, but that was for somebody. So anyway, that scripture shows that we have a complete redemption. Is that not right? Hebrews 9 and 12. From the entire curse and forgiveness is ours now. So what did, what did the blood do for us when it redeemed us from the curse and forgave us? It saves us. The, heal, the blood heals and delivers us. The blood cleanses and washes us. The blood protects us. The blood speaks for us. And the blood binds the devil. There's so many things that blood does, but we have a complete redemption. We're redeemed because of his blood. So when we eat, so every time I drink the cup, I need to be thinking about this is what is done for me. Past tense, always. And when we eat the bread from heaven, the Lord's body, scripture declares that we participate and share in fellowship and communion in the Lord's healing stripes. So that's also in that same verse, communion, participation, and fellowship and communion in the blood. And then it says, hallelujah, the bread which we break. Does it not mean that in eating it, we participate in and share fellowship, a communion in the body of Christ? So what did his body do? 1 Peter 2, 24. Every time I eat his body. That's why we have to distinguish between both parts because our way of escape comes from both parts. They both have done something significant to keep us whole. First Peter 2, 24, this is what his, he personally bore our sins in his own body on the tree as on an altar and offered himself on it that we might die and cease to exist to sin and live to righteousness. You see, when he forgave us of our sins, he made us eternally righteous. We live to righteousness. And then he says, by his wounds or his stripes, what tense? What tense? Past tense. Past tense. You have been healed. So when we receive the Holy Communion bread, we should not be saying, Lord, I'm eating this so you can heal me. The proof is, the proof is it's already done. And so what's going on in my body right now? I have every legal right to use the name, the blood, Come on, somebody. The word, the angelic help. I have the right to use whatever the Spirit of God gives me. I have a, a right to fight the good fight. Why is it good? Because it's a done deal. But I got to believe that that Holy Communion table is my way of escape. Dr. Krepfo said when they, when they diagnosed him with an aggressive cancer, him and his wife went in that hotel room, got away from everybody. He said he took his Bible and the Holy Communion kit. He said he got before God with that word and the Holy Communion, and he settled it. He said, cancer, you will not live in my body. Shout out both sides. He said he went back to the doctor on purpose for them to do it. He said, do new tests. He said, do some new tests. They couldn't find nothing. Why? He settled it. That Holy Communion was his way of escape. He said, after that, I committed to God that I would be a representative of the gospel of grace from that day forward. He didn't teach no more of that other stuff. His wife got delivered. His marriage got delivered. Now she preaching all over the place with him. I said, look at God. 
she got emancipated and set free. Hallelujah. He got under, under grace and found out that we're all equal in Jesus. You better give the Lord some praise right there. Yeah. So listen. So my question is, why does the body of Christ need a different way of escape from sin and sickness? Because <laughs> we don't have revelation. The Holy Communion meal is the proof of our complete redemption. Once and for all, finished. The stripes from the body of Christ healed and made us whole. The wounds and bruises from the blood of Jesus forgave us and made us eternally righteous. It's God's grace gift to us. Every time we eat the body and every time we drink the cup of the Lord's blood or the, or the cup of blessing, we are participating and sharing in the fellowship, the Holy Communion with the finished works of the cross. You got to look at it every night when I... I prepare my Holy Communion table every night before I go to sleep. And I sit in the presence of God. And I acknowledge what the bread has done for me. And what the cup has done for me. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Yeah. Just like you get up every day and brush your teeth. That Holy Communion should be in your life every day. This is the proof that both the forgiveness of all of our sins your and my sins have been finished and this is the proof that all of your and my sicknesses and diseases have been healed finished when on the same cross at the same time isaiah prophesied it and then matthew came back and confirmed that it was fulfilled i want you to stand to your feet Aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> Y'all think I'm joking, but I tell you, I'm just, I'm laughing at the devil. I said, the devil said, she, I'm just going to mess her up. She ain't going to get there and preach that. I said, yes, I am too. Oh, I was going to preach that word today. I know when God's anointing is on me for something, and I knew I had to release that word today. And I was praying for every person that's in here. I was praying that, God, you bring them today so that they would hear it from the beginning of the message to the end. Because let me tell you something. God built something in us that the enemy can't steal. Never, ever. Never, ever. So when you hear me say the proof, don't you take it down because I know what I'm saying. It's the proof that I've already been healed. It's the proof that I've already been forgiven. It's the proof that I am eternally righteous forever. That's my new identity. I'm the righteousness of God. That's why I can get up every day and say it. But when I say that, I'm acknowledging to heaven and specifically to hell, I am God's righteous. My angels line up to serve me because I am one of those who are heir of soteria because I acknowledge it. Don't think that they can do anything if you don't say anything. They only hearken, they only produce, they only move according to you speaking God's word. They will stand there unemployed in your life for the rest of your life. Come on, somebody, you got to declare what God has said about you. And if you think that there's some ritual or whatever, think whatever you want to. But it works because God says so. And you looking at a living witness right here that it does work. Yeah, when God told me years ago, woo, glory. He said, I want to see my body. He gave me, I believe it's Psalms 107 or one of those scriptures. Some of you theologians know what I'm talking about. When he said he bought them all out and not one feeble was amongst, amongst them. He bought them out of Egypt. The Lord said to me, and I want to bring my body out because we have a better covenant. Not one feeble, not one sick, not one afflicted. Come on, somebody. They came out not just healthy and whole. Not one was sick when they left out of Egypt, but also not one was poor. Not one was without favor. 
Those Egyptians said, hey, hurry up and get out of here. We done had enough plagues coming against us because of y'all. Let me tell you something. We got a better covenant. Don't tell me that the body of Christ ain't supposed to leave this earth, every one of us. I'm talking about in these bodies. Not when we get our new immortal bodies, but we need to bring glory to God in our bodies right now. Because guess what? He live inside of us. The healed one lives in us. I said the healed one lives in us. And he does care about our temples. Oh, bless his name. Father, thank you for the delivery of your word today. And this word will not return void. It's going to accomplish because it's full of creative power. And I thank you for the finishing work of Holy Spirit inside of every one of us. That we would give testimony that that situation, that circumstance came, that temptation, that trial. But I have a way of escape because you provided the only way. That's why it's called the way. That Holy Communion table that you told me to partake of until I see you return from me. You gave it to us so there will be nobody weak in the church, nobody sick in the church, and nobody dying prematurely in the church. You said, but for this reason it's happening, why? Because we have not discerned that the body has already healed us and we don't have to accept the symptoms. And your blood has already forgiven us and we don't have to accept the temptations to sin. You took care of everything on that cross. You left nothing out. It's a complete redemption, not a partial. So I thank you, Lord God, that every person that heard me in this sanctuary on today and even hallelujah over the media, um, I want to thank you, even those that will even get even more revelation from the tapes. Thank you so much, Father for your revelation knowledge concerning the most important ordinance given to the church is the Holy Communion table. Thank you, Father, for all that you have taught us today. Revelation, understanding, and not one devil can steal not one word from us because it's good seed and it went in good ground. And I release the apostolic authority over every person that will hear these words. And those, Father, that we're praying for, we're continuing to pray for Apostle Melissa. Lord, I prayed with Pastor Mary for Apostle Bobby, whose body is under severe attack again. Lord, I want to thank you today. For my daughter-in-law, for Doreen, being continuously attacked in her blood pressure. I pray today for Aunt Gloria, attacked in her lungs. I pray for Aunt Liz today. The enemy would loose her, that she will walk in the statue, in the authority of God, that Aunt Ida, as well, Lord God, would be strengthened in her balance and in her body. Lord, we pray for all those that have come under attack from the enemy, that there is no weapon, even if it's formed, against us that shall prosper. Thank you for this powerful word on today. Thank you for teaching us how to touch the glory the glory realm, Lord, where nobody even has to minister healing. Healing just flows through the people, through their bodies, through their minds, through their finances, through their marriages. Hallelujah. Lord, that full gospel will be a ministry that will walk in humility, but with great power and authority, knowing who we are in you, taking you wherever we go to make a difference in this world. I address every sickness and every disease by name, 
by assignment and I call you illegal. I address every attack of every person's mind in here, every organ, every tissue, every system, every cell, every bone, every chemical in your body, I command you in Jesus' name to line up with the word of God. And every one of us, after hearing this word today, Lord, will get in your presence with that Holy Communion table and declare the proof of those words. I've already been healed because of your body. I've already been forgiven, set free, and declared righteous because of your blood. And it ain't nothing the devil can do about it because I have a complete redemption and everlasting release from the entire curse. So, Father, I thank you for your manifest presence in this place today. Because, Father, we are not fighting a devil who has authority over us. He's a carn artist. He's a trickster and a liar. He has the body of Christ running from him. Well, your body says in John 16 that he's already been judged and sentenced. Shout out both sides. I thank you, Father, for the power of the blood of Jesus that surrounds us, our transportation, our homes, our families. We have some family members that's been stuck in the name of Jesus. We rebuke the devil right now from over their minds. Every single demonic influence over every person that belongs to our families, we loose them. Father, visit them no matter where they are. We clear the atmosphere in Jesus' name from all around them. In the name of Jesus, no more confusion around them. No more hostility. The enemy holding them hostage to anything. In the name of Jesus, clear the airways, Father, so that you can speak to their minds and their hearts and liberate and set them free. As the church was praying for Peter and Silas, Lord, breakthrough came because of their prayers. God, I thank you for the power of prayer amongst the intercessors in this house today. Thank you, God, for everything that you have done and everything you'll continue to do in us. Make us leaders that you can be glorified through, from the youngest to the oldest in this ministry. And we will be so careful to give you all the glory, praise, and honor as we pray this prayer in faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on and give the Lord some praise. Come on and give him some praise. Come on and open your mouth and give him praise. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on and see things being liberated and freed because of the blood and the body of our Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And I just want to say this one thing because the Holy Spirit reminded me. The, the main reason that God gave me such revelation on this message because he told me, he said, you tell your leaders they have got to teach the Holy Communion table the way they heard it today. We have got to be on one accord, according to the word. We have got to set people free. We have got to be a team of believers that will liberate and set people free. In the name of Jesus. Father, I've obeyed your command. Let our officers come forth as we can now bless the Lord with our tithes, offerings, and first fruits. I love you guys. Thank you for receiving. In Jesus' name. While they coming, I'm going to read some um, announcements. So if everybody that's not moving, please just listen up. I want to read these announcements so I don't have to do it at the end. So everybody that's not serving, look up this way at me so you won't get distracted. We, Good Eats is selling chicken soup and chicken wraps on today. All right.
I'm going to read some of it. Um, did we? March 9th, graduation rehearsal is at 10 o'clock. March 10th, perfecting school of ministry graduation ceremony is at 5 o'clock. We want all the full, full gospel to come out and support our graduating class. March 16th is our specialized classes, so all of our ministry gifts, please get to your classes. March 22nd through the 24th, the Ministry of Fine Arts Weekend, Restoring the Order of Worship. March 22nd, Friday night, service is at 6.30, free will. Please come out and invite people to come. Saturday, there's going to be a workshop at 10.30, and the cost is $15. And so um, Prophet Tony has a very anointed woman that's coming to teach those that want to learn how to choreograph. So my prayer is that people will come and support that. And we still have not given up on Apostle Melissa. So we're going to be talking with her Monday, and she's very interested in still coming. I think I let you all know that not one of those nodules was cancerous. We want to thank God for the power of prayer, y'all. So she, they 